So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay and to yet another battle that has been given to me by Tommy the Wise, albeit this one is not actually a custom scenario, this is purely a custom map that he has made, although I am told that this is the first one that he has made entirely from the ground up, which is kind of interesting. Um, and you can see that it's very much in that cityscape style where you have these natural cliff walls to represent the fortress walls and then you have the rather large but uh, sort of fairly widely spread buildings within. Um, it certainly makes pathfinding a little bit easier but yes it's a certainly a very layered settlement that the forces of good are going to be defending today because it is a good versus evil siege. I believe two elven armies along with the Gondorians are going to be on the defense. It's a fair amount of space they're actually going to have to try and dig in to try and defend but uh, We'll see how they go about it. This is a very large fortress. I don't think they're going to be able to defend the entirety of it from five attacking armies. Um, but they can pr give a pretty good fist of it. Um, and of course, with the Gondorians and with the various elven factions with their strengths, that's a very potent uh, possible... Well, that is a potent defensive wall to try and come up against and try to overcome. But yes, a large map with a lot of assets on it, actually. A very large settlement overall, if you can, if you count the uh, farmlands outside as well. But we'll go through the attacking armies first and foremost as we usually do, the forces of evil starting off with Adin Men over here who is playing as Rudawa Rudawa. I do think they're fairly invaluable actually as, a, uh, as an attacking army purely because they have the numbers, some of their units as well are not really any worse off defensively than the orcs if not better, um, but they're Attacking punch with their throwing projectiles and their armor piercing makes them really, really useful in most situations. Though defensively, they do lag behind um, a lot of the more high quality factions that you may run into. The Rudar clansmen, however, can't really be accused of that, especially not when they have the armor upgrade as they do here. Very good at dealing with arrow fire from the front because of those big shields and the armor only increases their durability as well. Um, among spears of this tier, they are actually a little bit better at inflicting damage as well, though not by too much. They are still very much about their defensive abilities and their ability to stay in the fight rather than do damage. The unit that's just in behind them, the other rank and file Rudau unit, the Rudau Swordsman, are going to be a little bit better at dealing damage to other infantry, but that's really where their advantages kind of end. Um, they have the same unit count as well, big unit numbers here over 200 per unit, another real uh, bonus for when you're playing as the Hillman. But yeah, the Rudar Swordsman, they're certainly not bad in class, and I would say that they are better than equivalent Orc units like Angmar Marauders and certainly Heavy Goblin Infantry, um, but when you come up against equivalent Kingdoms of Men unit from the West, they are going to struggle a little bit more, but they do have more numbers than them, so you could make the argument fairly successfully, I think, that they could be better than them as well. Just in behind, we also have the Atenmore's Troll Hunters. This is where we start to get into much more what Rudauer is all about. Throwing projectiles and the javelins on the Atenmore's Troll Hunters. If you get the right angle of fire, especially in this situation, given the kind of elevation that the defenders are going to be working with, but you can make that work against them if it means their units are exposed to full frontal javelin fire. Um, and the Atenmore's Troll Hunters are also one of the more durable units that Rudauer have, at least in terms of their regular stock because of the increased armor that they do wear in comparison to many of the other Rudal forces. There is a gap here which I would assume means there are probably Trollshaw axe throwers as well, the other standard throwing projectile unit that Rudal have. More numerous, cheaper, arguably more damaging against the right kind of unit as well. They may lack the armor piercing but the base damage on throwing axes is extremely high um, and they are one of the better unit types I think in the game as it stands. The meta favors a unit like that, I think. Rudal marksman as well, so skirmishing to be fair to Tommy, most of the maps and, maps and battles that he has sent me tend to be a little bit more all action, a little bit more uh, front and centre, so long periods of skirmishing between the two factions has been less something which has been a mainstay. It's been Arch has been largely incidental actually in many of the replays that he has sent me, and the Rudar Marksman, their main selling point really is the increased ammunition they have which, even in spite of their lower armor values, makes them pretty well suited for long periods of skirmishing. Though this battle is a little bit different, it is longer than many of the other battles that Tommy has sent me, though still not to the extent that many 3v5s can be, so the archers are still going to have to be fairly quick with it if they are going to uh, get the most out of their ammunition here. One of the bodyguard units for Rudar, the Franodyne Berserkers, another throwing projectile unit, throwing axes, and then they get into melee as an armor-piercing shock troop as well, with a shield, so they're fairly multifaceted, though melee defense and armor is ultimately a little bit lacking as well. 
uh, but that's the trade-off that you expect really with Rudauer. And speaking of which, we have the Witch Realm Enslavers. They're a pure melee unit, they don't have a throwing projectile, but they of course have uh, better damage stats than the Berserkers that we just saw. Very, very strong unit this, and the Armour Piercing will be very useful as we know against the Gondorians, and also against, I believe it's Lothlorien as one of the more armoured elven factions on the field today. T.S. Niehoff is playing as Mordor, pretty much an ever-present whenever evil is attacking. Sauron has his eye fixed everywhere, it seems. Sauron's Will, with more armor piercing, an upper-end unit of armor piercing as well, so this is the sort of thing which will be useful for the same reasons we've already mentioned. Minas Morgul Chosen, I am a big fan of this unit in the Mordor roster, because even though their damage value for the cost are fairly disappointing, Ultimately, their ability to stay alive is far from disappointing. Very, very useful indeed, this kind of unit, to have in and amongst your lower-end ones. Speaking of which, we do have the Orc Fodder here, purely for numbers, 250 of them individually, very, very weak. But because there are so many of them, you can't completely disregard them, and that does mean that the defenders will have to commit something in order to try and stop them. It's one of those units which is much better, however, as part of a combined assault. It makes Mordor seem very intimidating when you send them forward in a big horde. The Moranon Archers, kind of the same sort of thing applies here as to the Rudal Marksmen we've already talked about, um, though in this case they don't have the increased ammunition capacity, though I think their armour values are higher, so in many ways they are actually a better skirmishing archer, though considering it's elves and Gondor they're going up against, it's maybe not the right sort of theatre of war to contest with all of your might, merely just be an annoyance to them and win the battle through other means for the attackers, I would suggest. And Orc Javelins adding to the throwing projectile presence that the attackers have on the field today. Orc Javelins may not have the same punch as the ones from Rudauer, but their cost is so low, and of course this isn't a custom scenario, remember, so gold cost does come into play here in this particular battle. And uh, yeah, Orc Javelins, very good pick, I think. Two units of Blackguard of Baradur, which with the meta in this old version of the game um, still being what it is, I think the Blackguard of Baradur are pretty much a must pick in this sort of situation, because if you go forward all guns blazing and try and push through the defensive lines, it's exactly the sort of thing which can be very, very effective. And the big shields are also very useful for mitigating damage from archer-focused factions like all of the defenders are today. Temple Guard, however, do offer Mordor a lot of long-range punch as well, armor-piercing projectiles from afar, also a very good infantry unit as well, so a bit of a no-brainer to bring them. And then, of course, the pure melee-focused version of them, the Temple Executioners, coming with the armor upgrade that they can invest in as well very very nice for them and exactly the sort of thing which can go toe to toe with anything the defenders have to offer really olakai they need to be quite careful of the more damage focused melee units that the elves in particular can bring but if they get committed at the right time especially alongside the numbers and the great shield units that mordor have it could get pretty sticky for the defenders pretty fast now on to the third attacking army, and we have Angmar, played by the Warlord. Angmar's always an intimidating force to see on the attack because their defensive stats are so good, generally speaking, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it's not for reasons we will speak about. But for here, the Angmar Halberds are much more in line with what you would expect from any Orcish faction. Numbers, trying to use a certain aspect of the game mechanics in order to make up for their individually weak nature, so numbers once again, but also an armor-piercing phalanx. They will need to be a little bit careful of the pikes, which the defenders will have access to on this occasion. Yet more throwing projectiles, more axe throws as well in the shape of the Witch Realm. Scourge Raiders don't have the armour upgrade, which makes them a pretty juicy target for any defending archers that see them on the approach. The Blackwatch Legion are a very similar unit to the Black Guard of Baradur that we have already seen, though the Blackwatch Legion are individually stronger. Um, and they don't die off quite so easily, but you can only bring one rather than the two units that Mordor can roll with. The Witchers, ever the uh, unit that everyone loves to hate, they can decide battles all on their lonesome if they're committed at the right time, though this settlement being what it is, it should be fairly easy for the attackers, or defenders I should say, to see them coming um, and deal with them appropriately with uh, ranged force. We have the Witch Realm Hammergar, very similar to the Witch Realm Enslavers we've already seen. No armor upgrade for them today, but it's not necessary really. Um, their big armor piercing damage values are still going to be forthcoming. And we also have the Gundabad Guard. Interesting to see, actually, this is a fairly unorthodox uh, Angmar army. No Guardians of Khan Doom or Witch Realm Pikemen or Barrow Whites. So, well, actually, the Barrow Whites could be hidden, um, in all fairness, but those are the units which tend to make up the heavy metal approach that Angmar go with. 
Um, and then we also have the Trolls of Angmar back here as well. Um, very similar to the Olag High that we have already seen. Now moving on to Isengard, played by two times. He has got some Dunlending veterans, a similar unit in many ways to the Rudal Swordsman we've already seen, though they trade in a few numbers for a little bit of extra damage um, in terms of wielding an axe rather than a sword. Um, personally, I think the extra 20 men are actually more effective for a lower end unit like this, but the damage can still be useful, especially against Linden actually in the right uh, numbers. Urukai infantry, however, are the mainstay of the Isengard army, of course. Very good unit all round. What, pretty much the quintessential line infantry unit in many ways, in the sense that they don't break the bank. They're, you have to spend some money on them, but they're not overly expensive like other factions have to deal with, like uh, Umbar and Numenor. Um, but they're also capable of dishing out damage. They can take a real beating, and they synergize very well with the rest of the line as well. You'd expect that, though, maybe from Isengard. Some Half-Orc Spear Guard in here as well. Maybe a cheaper option for this sort of thing. Less damaging, certainly, but it gives uh, Isengard another shielded unit. Interesting to see the pikes out in front, but we all know that this is a very central part of what Isengard are all about as well. Isengard holding things down with their long phalanx units. Um, and then just in behind, we also have an Isengard Ballista again. If the defenders choose the wrong place to set up in, the Isengard Ballista could be absolutely devastating, or it could be a complete waste in a situation like this, given the kind of positions the defenders can take up. So we'll see. It, it does force the defenders to be a little bit more careful, though, perhaps. We also have some Urukai crossbows. Once again, positioning going to be everything here for the defenders to try and mitigate the damage that the crossbows are capable of doing. Because if crossbows get into a good position for attackers, that very often, all on its own, is enough to decide a match in their favour. And then we have Berserkers back here, very low armour and defence values, but three hit points keep them alive long enough for their huge armour piercing damage values to come into effect. The Nazkai, however, don't have to worry about such things, at least not to the same extent, because they do wear armour and they are a little bit more well trained as well, rather than just being shirtless madmen that charge into the fray. Athol Baneguard offer more armor piercing as well for Isengard. And finally, for the attacking armies, we have the Orcs of the Misty Mountains, played by Winter's Might. The same thing applies to the Heavy Goblin crossbows as to the Urukai crossbows, though I think the Heavy Goblin ones, um, well, yeah, the Heavy Goblin ones are going to be a little bit easier to shoot through at range. The Isengard armor, after all, stronger than the stuff that the goblins can cobble together in the form of the Balrog. But yes, the Heavy Goblin crossbows will have to be marshaled appropriately. Black Oryx of the Mountains, we have seen them be very effective in the past as well. Um, in this situation as well, they will trade more efficiently with the Elves than pretty much anything else in the Misty Mountains roster. Though they are unshielded, so another unit perhaps where archers are going to be key for the defenders. In fact, archers are going to be extremely important for the defenders, given that the numbers are what they are. Heavy Goblin Spears, an armor-piercing cheap spear unit like this, and... Certainly they're better than the Heavy Goblin Infantry as well. Um, it's one of the main things with the Misty Mountains, really. If you can help it, then you always really want to be bringing the Spears. Maybe not against Linden, if Linden were on their own, but there are armor-focused factions on the defense, most certainly. Heavy Goblin Halberds, very, very similar to the Angmar Halberds we've already seen. Greater than the sum of their parts, but, or, well, they add up to be greater than the sum of their parts, I think, this uh, particular unit, because of how many of them there are. And there's a Phalanx unit, um, trying to make them as efficient as possible for a very low cost unit um, can really make a big difference in the end. Though if you do need to rely on a bit of quality in a phalanx, then the White Oak Fear Mongers do provide that for you if you want to play as the Misty Mountains. And then at the back, we have the Goblin King's Bodyguard as well, the safest place to put your general. Very run-of-the-mill kind of sword and board bodyguard unit this, but they definitely get the job done as we have seen in the past. Now then, for the defenders, we have Tommy himself playing as the Realm of Lothlorien going to be beating a hasty retreat into the settlement as quickly as he is able. And you can see here that the funds are fairly lavish for the elves because we have the Watchers of the Golden Wood, which is where Haldir is, Silverthorn Arrows, and then two units of upgraded Kindred of Caliborn with their split shots. Uh, the split shots are not quite as effective as ranger ammunition in this patch, but even still, it is still deadly and they make for a very strong melee combatant as well. In terms of damage dealing, in fact, their high-end archers are actually their best melee combats as well on Lothlorien. Karen and Roth Rangers. Rangers are going to be absolutely vital for the defenders on this occasion. I think, uh, especially the elven ones, I mean, both units, of both forces of elves have got access to rangers. Um, and with the extra points of damage they can deal, it can be utterly devastating. No cavalry, actually, that we can see for the attackers today. So the Riders of the Golden Wood may have the free reign of the field, as long as they can avoid something especially deadly like the crossbows, which... 
could be interesting. Full Silverthorn Arrow usage and then utilizing them as a makeshift shot cavalry unit could be a way to get a lot of efficiency. We also have Lorenard Archers in here, so they're going to be... If they do need to skirmish with the enemy, this is not Lorien's best bet, but I would say that based on this settlement, if they're having to skirmish with the enemy, they're kind of doing a bit wrong. They should be able to take their pick of the attacking forces. We mentioned how important throwing projectiles are going to be for the attackers, but also for the defenders. The Woodland Protectors, for what they are, are actually nothing particularly special, but they are still capable of dishing out a decent amount of damage at range. In melee, they represent really just another brick in the wall. They're a decent defensive spear, but damage dealing is going to have to be done by other Lothlorian units. Fortunately, they do have the options to do so. Karas Galadon's Guardians, arguably the best pike unit in the game with that second hit point they have. If it comes down to a last stand um, and the attackers have no means of hitting them from afar, then it's definitely the sort of unit which can win Lothlorian the game. March Warns of the Wood with their poison projectiles, given the low tier nature of many of the attacking uh, units today, Morale is one weapon that can be used against them, and Poison Arrows allow you to do that with a little bit more strategy than just hoping the enemy break upon your lines. Um, yeah, March Wardens are very, very nice. Lauren and Axemen are going to be really good at dealing with those high numbers units as well, because that extra damage they deal is going to carve through units with lower melee defense. And then over here we also have Lauren and Spearmen, so they're going to be good for holding the line a little bit more defensively orientated than those Axemen. And then also the Lauren Armed Warriors. So again, more armor piercing. Armor piercing is definitely going to be useful for the defenders as well today. Only Rude Hour really among the defenders are not uh, really about that armored lifestyle. Now then, moving into the settlement itself, we have her Tumihai who's playing as Linden. Another cavalry unit as well in the Horse Lords of Ulmo. So they don't have a ranged attack, but again, no defense or attacking cavalry that we can see. So the Horse Lords could have free reign. Um, and they could be extremely devastating. They are very, very good off the charge, but no shields and lightly armoured as all Linden forces are. Pikes are something Linden don't want for, however, and pikes could be really, really useful, actually, with only Isengard really having brought pikes to the extent uh, that they could trouble Linden. Mithrond pikemen, however, pretty much on the same tier as the Urukai, maybe more capable of dealing damage, though their light, their light armour does hurt them a bit in that regard. Over here we have some four Linden archers, so even basic Elven archers are going to be good for dealing damage to the attackers as they move forward. Mithlon Swordmast as well, good for mulching their way through all of the low-end units. The Noldoran units, both the Bodyguard tier Blade Masters and the merely high-end line infantry that are the Noldoran Guard are going to be very important for Linden here because they do represent um, really the cream of the crop when it comes to high armor Elven units that we're going to see on the field today anyway with Imladris absent. Um, and very capable of dealing damage as well, especially again to those more numbers heavy units, which the attackers do have a lot of, so quality is going to be the order of the day, as you would always expect with two elven factions on the defence. Javelins, more javelins of course, Linden very much com competent in that theatre of warfare as well, with four Linden marines, um, and I think as well we've got some Harland infantry, maybe some Mithlon marines are in there too, but yeah, Harland infantry for the tier of unit that they are in melee are very very good. Again, it's the light armour which always makes Linden a little bit of a grey area for me, with the meta of the game being what it is, Linden can struggle in that regard, but as long as they have uh, certain factions to back them up, they should be fine. And speaking of which, uh, when it comes to a slog where armour is a little bit more important, Winged Swordsman playing as Gondor here should be able to make up for some of uh, Linden's deficiencies in that regard, and another cavalry unit as well in the Mithrandir's retinue, which can be used uh, to a devastating extent on the uh, on the defense here given the lack of tools to deal with it outside of those crossbows of course if they can avoid the crossbows with their cavalry here the defenders it could be happy hunting for them but it's going to come down to the skill of the individual players to make that work more armor piercing from the axemen of Lasarnak, more armor piercing from the citadel guard as well though with a more defensive edge to it gondor archers very capable of skirmishing should the need arise but again if they can help it they really should be going after targets that they deem the most necessary the Witchers are one thing which uh, really ought to be uh, front and centre in the defenders' minds. Axemen of the Sarnak again, Citadel Guard again, fully upgraded, Gondor Spearmen, along with the Archers of course having access to those cheaper upgrades that Gondor do, and again, not being a scenario, the uh, budget is important. Citadel Guard, Fountain Guard, uh, Marksman of Ker Andros as well, very capable of chipping in in melee late on, which all Archers have to do when they're on the defence, it always comes down to that. Fountain Guard, of course, in this version of the game, still being a Phalanx unit means that they're going to have to uh, dig in and uh, 
rely on that a little bit more. So Athelian Rangers are hiding in and amongst the fully upgraded veterans of Osgiliath. Unsurprising to see Gondor go for so many archers, given the situation is what it is, and archers are going to be the way the defenders win or lose this, I think, with a little bit of a sprinkling of having to use their cavalry um, to a good extent as well. Armor piercing from the wards of Minas of Thiel, picking and choosing their target, very important for a unit like that. More marksmen, more citadel guard, and a couple of units of Pelagian marines as well, which are very similar to the javelins from Linden and Lothlorien. There's nothing exceptional about these guys, um, whether in terms of value, like Mordor's orcs, or whether it be in terms of just sheer effectiveness, like the ones Rudauer roll with. Um, but they are still a very important piece of this defensive puzzle. There's actually a unit over here as well, which is the trebuchet, which just forgot to move, but based on how far away the attackers are, the trebuchet will be able to move into position fairly quickly. Another important uh, tool, actually, the trebuchet will be very deadly. A couple of units of Harland and Guard up here as well. But I think I will make a little bit of a cut, actually, given uh, we are you know, the armies are fairly far apart. But I actually imagine it's not going to take too long, because I do think the cavalry is going to be the first thing to make an impression here. Um, and it's going to be important that the defenders actually make it so that it is able to do so. Um, so yeah, I'll rejoin when the battle is about to begin. So, from your perspective, uh, it's only been literally a few seconds, but from my perspective it's actually been quite a while because I am recording the main battle section of this one after uh, a trip away for work. So this is going to be rather interesting. So we're back with one of Tommy's creations here. One of the more classic ways of making a cityscape with these natural looking fortifications. It is a rather big settlement as well, as I'm sure I mentioned in the battle intro. But yeah, it's going to be quite interesting here because I do think actually the mixture of defensive factions is actually very, very good. I think Linden and Gondor are obviously two very different approaches when it comes to how they handle their defensive prowess. Um, very solid front lines there in terms of melee defense and armor. Lothlorien split the difference a little bit more. And of course, all of the defensive factions today have got access to some very strong archers, which they will need because, I mean, just look at this uh, force as it starts to move forward. Rudar may very well have revealed a few units that were hidden now that they're moving forward. Black Waltz among them, a dangerous foe certainly for any of the armoured forces that are on the defence. Berserker class units of course can be very effective against such things so the Gondorians will have to be very careful. I'm very certain that there's probably going to be some troll shawl axe throwers and indeed there is a lot of standard Rudar axemen and Pranodyne rangers so good Supporting cast here from Rudar, plenty of armor piercing punch and ranged power as you would expect, it's what makes them so useful on the attack. Mordor, more of a numbers focus and those great shield infantry units are going to be very very dangerous as well. We've already briefly mentioned the fact that with Angmar on the field, these guys, the Witchers, are going to be very very important. The Barrowites have revealed themselves as well, it's going to take them actually quite a while to get to the front line, the battle will almost certainly be underway before they arrive, but as soon as they do arrive, you can't really make Angmar go away without killing them entirely, and it takes such a long time <coughs> with the Barrow Whites in tow, and then Isengard of course as well, the Ballista, already mentioned that if you can get into a good position, the Ballista, it, uh, it should be able to do quite a lot of damage. Riders of the Goldenwood take up a position here as more of a fast moving archer unit to get up onto these fortifications and I suppose they're going to start shooting down into the Angmarim advance which is fair enough. Plenty of good targets. I mean even if you do have to go, go after something like the Halberdiers they're going to fall away very very quickly. The Silverthorn Arrows are one of the ways although it's hard to execute to also try and stifle the momentum of a great shield infantry push but it really is quite difficult to make that work. You need to have a really good angle and you need to hope that the volleys land at just the right moment, otherwise it's going to have very little impact. There's not really going to be anything that the attackers are going to be able to do to avoid the defender's wrath on the approach. They're just going to have to trust in the fact that their manpower will be enough to still smash those defensive lines to, sp lines to splinters when they finally do arrive. They do have their choice of targets here, for the most part. The Witches, I imagine, are going to stand well clear for the time being, otherwise they will certainly be the ones to become a cropper of the Silverthorn Arrows first and foremost. Half-Orc Spear Guard moving forward as the first unit. Not a good choice of target for the Mithrandir's retinue initially, nor the Horse Lords of Ulmo, wherever they may be. There is also the small matter of those archers way up on high over there. 
and the vantage point is so significant that they're going to be able to shoot whatever they please on the attack. If the battle does take place close to this rather large cliff wall, then many of the arrows will probably hit the dirt, as this kind of fortification very often does cause. Why are we here? Still a small matter of trolls pulling out very wide. We also have a rude hour. So initially, I think they actually weren't going to defend this uh, little outer layer, but there are only two ways in. So it looks as though Gondor and Lothlorien are in fact going to do that. And the first actual damage is going to be dealt now. Temple Guard getting hit by some of the Silverthorns there. They were trying to get into position to actually shoot back the Temple Guard, which is not the worst idea, but they're going to find it difficult here. Skirmishing with a unit of Silverthorn Arrow units. I mean, all of them are multiple HP for a start, so it's going to be difficult to kill them off quickly. Um, the armor-piercing archers do allow you to do that at the very least, but you can see that as the units get knocked over, of course, they cannot then return fire. So it's actually one of the very, one of the most difficult units to skirmish with. Um, and in this case as well, the Temple Guard are a very worthwhile unit to go after because of their ranged punch and the fact that they are ultimately a very good unit in melee as well. Um, certainly no worries about wasting any ammunition there. Lorian archers also doing the same, firing into other such units on the way forwards, I believe. We're also going to be getting into the swing of things from a melee standpoint over here, first and foremost. Mithrandi is rescue pulling back. The Gondorians taking up a nasty position over here as well, so the crossfire is going to be real. Um, there is, of course, the small matter of this little side entrance over here, which... The Orcs of the Misty Mountains could decide to go up if they so choose, but Linden are here in their full force, so we shall see. Trebuchet on the move in the background over there as well. Goblin Band, the first ones to move forwards. Not terribly surprising, I suppose, but they're going to bounce right off of any manner of prepared Gondorian front line. So we shall see what awaits them. So far, still, the skirmishing is all that is occurring. Yeah, those Temple Guards really have. They've killed one right with the Golden Wood, but that whole unit has been pretty much devastated. Archers doing their best to avoid shooting their own arrow, uh, arrows into the cliff in front of them, and they're doing a pretty good job of that, actually. The angles are set just so. If they're going after Sauron's will, which I believe they are, then they're going to hit something. Unfortunately for them, the Black Guard of Baradur will be able to shrug off an awful lot of damage from this angle, I believe, but Sauron's will... An orc javelins won't, so good amount of damage being inflicted here. It will at least light a fire under Mordor. They won't be able to dawdle maybe as long as they would like. Rudal swinging out wide has helped them, though. They are less prepared to deal with this kind of pressure in comparison to their Mordor allies. Of course, lots of Ulmo moving backwards. Goblin band. Getting drawn into the fight, of course, Citadel Guard will be extremely comfortable against a foe on the level of the Goblin Band. Mithrandi's rescue coming forwards now. I mean, if they can get their lances down, this could be really good against the trolls, but... Uh, they do manage to connect with one of the trolls at the very least, but the Goblin Band really did break up that charge there. So that's actually... I don't know if that was intentional from the Warlord, but if it was, then that uh, ended up working out very nicely in their favour. They did kill off a fair number of the Goblin Band as well, but it's not the sort of unit you want to get tangled up in. Even the most basic spears can uh, get a decent amount of value in this sort of situation as the Gondor Spearmen now also lurch forward into the melee. Gondor Spearmen not ideal against the Trolls. The Citadel Guard's armour piercing will help them significantly. A bit of range support will only come in when there's more numerous units of infantry to hit. Trolls not really ideally placed. In come the cavalry again, though the lances didn't come down, so they're just going to sort of clumsily bump into this situation. They need to be careful as well, otherwise they're going to have their escape route slammed shut by yet more Goblin Band. Interesting to see so many of this unit. They're horrendously overpriced for what they are. A uh, little... Uh, Another little uh, pathway can be taken here, so there's two choke points to look after, and the Gondorians are not facing the right direction for now, but a combination of Fountain Guard and Axemen of Lasarnak are the sort of units which will certainly give Angmar pause. What's ideal from their perspective? More Citadel Guard coming in. The Goblin Band, which are in support of the Trolls, are falling away pretty quickly, and with the Axemen of Lasarnak as well, 
this kind of unit ideally suited for killing trolls with their very high base damage and the armor piercing to boot the trolls without significant support and the goblin band don't really count as that We're going to struggle and fire arrow is also being utilized now to try and force the issue there horse swords of Ulmo we also saw briefly there in behind enemy lines four linden archers in place very stretched here the army of winters might the misty mountains orcs and goblins so the skirmish is moving around the side i mean they to a certain extent have got all the time in the world if they do move forward quickly the full strength of linden is going to be too much for them to really withstand caliborn over there whereas two attacking armies are going to be trying to deal with the gondorian front line and the oof Lothlorien front line. I mean, there was a little bit of friendly fire there, but for the most part, that did connect with only Gondorian units, and already they're shaken as a result of that, in spite of the fact they've been in the ascendancy in the melee fight thus far. Just in behind, Riders of the Golden Wood charging in as well. Going to try and break the Snaga Stalkers, these very low tier but very numerous units, which the manpower discrepancy can look less daunting. Once you deal with a bit of that, Athelian Rangers with one volley. Oh, the Barrow Whites as well, this little side path being pressurised, though like I said it's going to take more than a single unit of Goblin Band to even scratch the kind of forces that they have set up there. We've our Clansmen moving into place, Protectors, March Wardens we already mentioned in the intro to this battle as well, I'm sure the Poison Projectiles, we've already seen Fire Arrows used, but Lorien can do that latently without having to use a special ammo type that eats more ammunition. Unarmed archers firing in as well. Trollshore axe throwers of course can be so dangerous. They're also very vulnerable though. Not great in melee and obviously poor at dealing with arrow fire such as this. As they move forwards. Blackguard of Baradur. First one's in. If they have enough units to really make any gains stick, then committing the Blackguard early is not the worst thing to do, but you do need to make sure that you have got those reinforcements coming in. I mean, there are a lot of Orc fodder around. There's a few units from Rudau here. Spear on spear, of course. We already mentioned the merits of the Rudau clansmen, though in pure melee times, of course, the Elven ones have certainly got the advantage here. Lives of the Golden Wood. Nudging into the orc fodder, not really recommended. Now, marks on you. Here come the the black guard. They will be able to push through here, though. To what end? What are they going to be able to do? Karen Amroth Rangers are in place. All of these great shield infantry units are, of course, going to be a concern for the defenders. But if they can make it so that their usefulness is stifled, and on this occasion, I think it might be. Lorenard warriors. There's more of these Lorenard axemen moving in as well. Lorne Armed Axemen will be ideal against stuff like Orc Fodder. Piling up a hefty kill count there. And also the Black Guard getting sort of wedged here. So their momentum has stalled. And that means poison projectiles and superior melee quality will surely cause them to break at some point. Pure melee prowess is not their MO. The protectors, March Wardens. Firing back and forth forward come the Rudar Axemen as well. Oleg High. And further over here then, Horse Lords of Ulmo still flitting around. Yeah, the Barrow Whites are now in place and the Gondorians are still shaken. This, this bit of Mordor over here as well, which is kind of weird. Do Angmar and Isengard really need that extra support? Have they identified Gondor as the weak link? I'm not sure I would have said so in this situation. They have more numbers than their elven counterparts after all. It's going to be harder to outright overwhelm their front lines. And while Halberd's taking hits, the Stelgard's victorious. Archers from on high also continuing to fire down. The exact impact of all of this remains to be seen. Isengard trying to get their crossbows in support, which of course could be devastating, but at least some of the archers from on high Re recognize the threat that they pose. We've already seen the 
the artillery used from Isengard, they're actually kind of lucky there, the attackers, that didn't connect in as significant a way as it could have done. Just look at all these archers now, flying arrows flying back and forth. Wards of Minas Thiel were there as well. Armour piercing will be very useful against the Minas Morgul Chosen that found themselves over here. Unfortunate here to get a bit of friendly fire, but you live and die by the sword when using artillery. Minas Morgul Chosen are already wavering as well. Angmar Halberds, having given, been given a bit of a beating from the archers, are now getting into melee as well. I mean, surely with fire arrows, they're not going to last too much longer. With the Goblin Band going to suffer the same fate of routing, I fear. Gundabad Guard going to try and go around the houses quite literally to maybe get, get at the Athelian Rangers. If they can sneakily do that, that will be a big win, even if it's only a temporary stopping of the Athelian Rangers. Taking them offline for as long as possible could be absolutely vital here. This battle is starting to get a little bit more chaotic, you would have to say. Wooden protectors here. Karas Galadon's guardians as well, but it's going to have to be the heavy axemen that deal with the Olag High quickly. The Olag High have managed to get in and amongst the trebuchet crew as well, so this is good work from the attackers to really shut down one of the main tools, which would be more dangerous. I mean, the trebuchet crew is weaker. The Karen Amroth Rangers with a two-handed sword can actually uh, look after themselves a little bit more in melee, so maybe the Olag High are doing the right thing here. But in the end, the momentum that those Black Guard were able to give the attackers here has really paid dividends as Rudauer and Mordor are now very much on the forward march and perhaps another example of how the elves low numbers does cause them to come undone a little bit at times as much as their quality level is very high if you don't allow them to get set and use their quality in certain ways then it can become they can become a little bit of a liability to be fair which is probably a good thing for the balance of the game the Black Guard of Baradur at the centre of things, not able to route them quickly enough, you'd have to say. Archers able to shoot into whatever targets they choose. This could end up being the saving grace for the defenders as well. The fact that when the attackers are moving forward like this, they have no choice really but to commit and go all in to a certain extent. And the damage that could be inflicted as a result may very well be terminal. What is going on over here then? Snaga Skirmish is trying to do their thing, taking the slower approach to Misty Mountains, which is the right thing to do in all fairness. Linden is still really far too strong for Misty Mountains on their own to deal with up here, so any damage they can do would be welcome. But I think with the threats that are going on on the other side, I think the Misty Mountains could also get away with being more aggressive, because it would prevent Linden from siphoning off their own units to help their allies. They would need their full strength to meet the challenge of the Misty Mountains, and then even if Misty lost, they would at least push Linden close, and the battle could then be won overall for the attackers elsewhere on the battlefield. Over here, we do have Watchers of the Golden Wood firing away. Going after the Temple of the Temple Execution is not the Temple of Executioners. Kindred of Caliborn firing down. They've got a pretty good angle here as well. All of these high tier Lorian archers. Still something that will have to be dealt with in melee as well. Though alone against a massive force, they will not have the capabilities to do so. Karas Galadon's Guardians, as much as we've seen them be exceptional before, the Olag High have muddied the waters somewhat, and they're not. The position is not ideal, the attackers can swamp over them, and as much as their stats are significantly stronger than a lot of other pike units, they still do rely on their formation a fair amount, with Orc Javelins as well, I think this is going to be then destroyed. And Gondor have elected to pull back, and they have done so, so at the very least they have been able to do that. So there's some Linden presence on the front line as well, though they too are getting bulldozed. So far the Great Shield Infantry at the very centre of what the attackers have been trying to do, as is very often the way. Trump Scourge Raiders, plenty of units still for the attackers as well. They were made to pay for their gains here, the attackers, but not to the extent, I think, that would have been ideal. Barrow White still going to be a presence in the late game as well. Those Blackwalls are getting hit now by split shots. 
Berserker class units very often have little to no armour. As soon as those hit points are gone, that'll be the end of them. Lauren armed archers and march wardens in melee. Token force only being committed by the attackers here. Which is going to result in their defeat if they're not careful. And, I mean, the fact that Lorians still have these units on these walls, we've also seen over there the Lauren armed archers. Stuff needs to be committed to deal with them, and elven archers being as competent as they are in melee means it can't be any old rubbish from the attacks. It can't just be the offcuts. They are going to need something a little bit more substantial than that. Over down there, and our marksmen still on the way forwards. Our swordsman as well. Yeah. Quality still. The Olaikai is still alive, which, to be fair, I think the Olaikai, <coughs> as much as the Great Shield infantry here, deserves a huge amount of credit because they were able to do real damage to the Trebuchet crew. Clearly, they were able to cause havoc in the rear lines of the defenders which contributed greatly to their need to fall back here. Although surely that's not going to last too much longer, these Axemen of Lasarnak. Each swing of those swords, very occasionally one of them manages a parry, but they need to bring this monster down. And finally they do. A combination now of Linden and the like, but again we're seeing the Orc Javelins be such a pain kind of unit which you really don't want to be allowing to get kills on something as strong in melee as the Noldering Guard. And that is exactly what's happening here. Karen Amroth Rangers in behind. Not a huge amount of cavalry. Well, 24. Are we seeing a more substantial push now from the Orcs of the Misty Mountains? Maybe. They're still trying to skirmish, I think, largely. Goblin infantry are running. Heavy Goblin Spears, of course. Probably one of the few matchups in which they won't be a really nifty and efficient low to mid tier unit. The armor piercing will largely go to waste against Linden, though their slightly better defensive stats means they will at least be able to stay standing for just that little bit longer. So it's not the end of the world, I suppose. counter-attack here. I mean, Misty Mountain's still pulling their punches to a certain extent. Up here. What are the Harlinden Guard shooting at? Not a huge amount. There's still Lorian archers on this outer wall. They're going to be overwhelmed now, though. I don't know how many units they necessarily were able to kill in melee up here. It doesn't look like that many in all honesty. Maybe they were still trying to use their bows or maybe Lorian simply lost micro on them but still another neat win there for the attackers. Still on that ballista as well which we haven't seen it used too much of its ammunition yet but what we have seen very nicely done as well. Rudar Swordsman trying to push up and a very, very run-of-the-mill kind of infantry unit, but here in numbers, though they are struggling still against that elven quality. Perhaps to the surprise of absolutely no one. Further down. Hmm. Got a marksman offering their support. If they can get a good angle, the March Warden's very low armor values will be a problem. I mean, this, I think, is also a bit of a problem as well from a defending point of view. They're being quite stubborn about their lines being in this position here, when I think they need to move forward, ultimately, because the amount of damage they've taken at the hands of Javelins at this point, Orc Javelins and the more dangerous Etimals Troll Hunters, has probably been to an unacceptable level at this point. Maybe, though, they've already made the call, and now must simply stick with it. We shall see. There's still one more retreat they can make, but that does depend a little bit on uh, on Linden 
managing to maintain their position as well. The two ways up here. It is a vast settlement. I do appreciate as well that it's never one that's going to devolve into one choke point, as much as that can very often be the making of defenders. It does make for quite one-dimensional battles, but there's at least two ways up, or two ways for the attackers to approach things, no matter the situation here. And here, a combination of heavy goblin halberds and heavy goblin spears doing the business here. Linden will need their pikes. As soon as the pikes get into position, that should be where the heavy goblins start to struggle a little bit. But Linden's lightweight nature is maybe on full display here once again against units again against units which they should be pretty damn strong against. Yes, there's a lot of, of goblins here, but they are struggling. Maybe this could be to do with the line building of Linden as well. Four Linden archers in support as well. I mean, they're going to need more on the front line. I think Linden are trying to be as efficient as they possibly can with it, but I don't know if they have the luxury of this anymore. Things are looking a little bit ropey for the defenders as we do move into the final 10,000 frames. What have we here? Commitment of infantry, well I say infantry units, Atomals, troll hunters, presumably out of ammunition, so committing themselves to melee one-on-one. -on -one. Their enhanced armour for Rudaur is not going to be enough to give them a win against the Noldorin Guard. Unfortunately for them, Further afield, Barrow Whites, several of them bloodied, I don't know, Barrow Whites, I know that it's a, a quirk of medieval too, but Barrow Whites, would they bleed? Probably not. Oof. And again, this is going to continue to be punishing on the front line for Gondor. In all fairness, if they were to have a unit that throwing axes would hit the front of, upgraded veterans of Osgiliath with shields facing the right way would be the ones, because throwing axes do have their damage mitigated by shields a bit, but their base damage is so high that it's still going to be a vicious thing to try and withstand. We've got marksmen as well, so all manner of out of ammunition projectiles being committed by Rudar, including Blackwolds who have managed to overlap around the line. Not the sort of unit that you want to give any sort of agency to, though the Watchers of the Golden Wood will be able to deal with them, especially seeing as some of the black walls are already bloody. So that will be fine for them. Dunman Pikeman on the march. The laser-like projectiles of those split shots as well. The artillery getting some good hits actually. And the fact they were able to save the trebuchets from the Olag High's incursion could prove to be a very important factor in this battle, but clearly the skirmishing phase is at an end, the attackers feel as though they can now move forward and do the business. Harland and Guard being committed by Linden to try and help solidify the Gondorian line, though maybe overextending themselves a little bit. At least it was another hit and not completely wasted there. Wardens of Minas Athiel as well, plenty of routing going on now. What about the Misty Mountains? Things still over here taking on a significantly slower tier approach. The Black Uruks will find themselves more at home fighting off against a force like Linden than much of the rest of the Misty Mountains roster. Slow and steady may very well end up winning the race for the Goblins over here though. Forward come the Four Linden Archers once again. Goblin Spears also. Snow Trolls. Mm. Well. This is a problem. A significant problem for Linden. We've already seen trolls used very effectively on the other side of the field, and now snow trolls are very, very quick. Not as quick as cavalry when it gets up to a gallop, but the horse lords are all now getting hit, and I mean the snow trolls will also be able to really set about a unit as vulnerable in melee as the fallen archers. I mean, yes, elves are always going to be able to 
would stand against equivalent infantry units, but trolls against very light archers like this is going to end badly. Yeah, this is a, this is a bad, bad time for Linden. Being stingy on the front line may very well cost them pretty significantly there, but we'll see. And like I said, if Linden falls, there's no easy route to fall back on. I think the best way for the defenders then would be to try and maybe use one of the walls as a last stand. Backs to the wall style. Older and Blade Masters moving in. I mean, to be fair, over here the attackers have been stifled. Let's not forget that this is technically the route that four of the attacking armies at this point are going to have to take with the Misty Mountains on their lonesome on the other side, though. Linden, of course, we have seen units bit by bit be committed in support of their allies as well, so that may give the goblins the initiative they need in the fight. Plenty of damage being inflicted by all these archers. Hmm. Rook High Infantry. It's more to Minister Thiel. Getting into melee as well. They may be multiple HP, but they're not really intended as a bodyguard tier melee combatant, though they will do a job and they will have to. In this sort of situation, Odd Nine Shadow Bows trying to do their thing. That higher armor value going to be extremely useful for them. Still, the Nolder and Blade Masters. But again, Great Shield Infantry. I just don't see how the defenders at this point can stop the momentum that the attackers have. And as they roll forwards, Uruk High Infantry following the Blackwatch Legion in. The unit marks Makar Andros there to meet them, but the initial damage may have already been done. Again, look at this, another, the trolls, the snow, the snow trolls, instead of going after the Linden units, they've once again decided to go after the trebuchet, which could be a real difference maker in this battle, and surely they, they've escaped one unit of trolls, but I think this may be a bridge too far for the Gondorian artillerymen. The Union Rangers trying to do their thing, try, but also getting hit by attacking skirmishers. This side of things for the attackers is starting to fall apart a little bit, the Noldoran units especially with the support of the bodyguard tier Lothlorian ones struggling. This front line over here as well is still holding for Gondor, whether that will remain the case long term remains to be seen. Have the Misty Mountains been able to consolidate their gains over here? Not really actually. Linden have actually done a reasonable job, Wands of Alostyrian over here, they've managed to if the Snow Trolls had stayed over here and gone after some of the softer targets behind enemy lines, there goes the Rudar General, then perhaps Linden would be struggling a bit more, but it's fair enough to assume that the Trebuchet would be a, a more valuable prize, but that does also give Linden more of a chance when it comes to this sort of thing. Four Linden Archers are still there, Wardens of Alos Tyrion. in melee with their dual wielding. Snaga not routing, but getting out of harm's way in melee. Any javelins that can be applied to the situation would be very much appreciated, and crossbows are still there also. The last wave of Misty Mountains forces will be committed forward, alongside stuff like the Blackbacks. I do think the Misty Mountains will probably still have too much for Linden, but Linden have made them work harder for it than maybe they would have done. Speaking of which, Nolder and Blade Master still there. Ooh, witches. Is this going to be it? Is this going to be where the battle <coughs> is put beyond the defenders? There's an awful lot of marks on a Care Andros that just got grilled. We've seen more devastating witcher shots, but considering the discrepancy the defenders are facing, this is not the sort of punishment they can afford to take. And this entire defensive position already gone. I mean, I see why people don't like the witches, to be honest. Having to remain completely alert for the entirety of the battle is a little bit much to ask of defenders, I think. On an open field, it's a different matter, I suppose, but yeah. Linden falls, or Linden's general falls anyway. The army still fights for now. This front line, actually, the Fountain Guard have managed to rally a little bit. The 
snow trolls after they killed the trebuchet crew? No, there's still eight trebuchet crew left. So that could still be active, potentially. So that may be a little bit of an oversight by Winter's Might. Over here, more units now coming in. Urukai pikemen, Urukai berserkers. It's a really robust attacking force to have to face, in spite of how well the defenders have done on this front line with their strength. Lorien's bodyguard units, the Noldorin from Linden, to have to deal with another wave of this quality is probably asking a bit too much. And there we have it. Karen Amroth Rangers on the way down. Moran on Arch as well. There are the Witchers. Is it going to be another... Oh, there goes the other Elven General, Haldia catching a projectile in the face. Although I suspect this is probably going to be... Well, the Witchers are actually being engaged in melee, in all fairness. You need to do a slightly better job of trying to shoot them here, the, the uh, defenders, otherwise they're going to suffer a hideous fate indeed, and indeed there go the Karen Amroth Rangers. They've taken too much damage at the hands of the Witchers at this point. I think the, the outcome of the battle at this stage is more or less set. Well, Linden Arch is still there. Back over here. Victory seems certain. Slaying the enemy general. Is that correct? Winds of Alostirian. Yeah, I mean, even over here, taking a pummeling at the hands of Angmar's witches over there. If Linden were being dominant over in this fight, maybe things would be a little bit different. But sadly for them, the Misty Mountains are also going to have too much in the way of numbers. It's been a valiant attempt. It's a lot of ground for three defenders to cover against five numbers heavy attackers in this kind of situation. So from that perspective, they've not done too badly. But there are a few situations. I mean, yes, the Witchers one such thing. Fighting side by side with the Nazgul directly. That's kind of interesting. Nazgul, of course, put the Witchers to shame in, uh, in melee terms. Though the Witchers, I would argue, are far and away the more devastating unit. You can see clearly where the line is. The black and blue capes caked in blood. And now overlapping around on archers. Simply using everything as a melee unit at this point. Just as a bludgeon to beat the enemy with is probably the way to go for the attackers. And uh, that is the modus operandi at all times for the Urukai Berserkers. Elsewhere, ran on archers. Karen Emroth Rangers there, Urukai Crossbowmen in place. There are 18 horse lords of Ulmo, allegedly, with a few of them just sort of hanging out on that cliffside there. Four linden archers, getting in behind enemy lines. This is the sort of thing which, if we saw a little bit more of it, the attacking support would have been less effective. Orc javelins being set about by four linden archers. Though it is difficult. I do think the attackers have actually played this very well with the tools that they have, and if the attackers do that in a 5v3, it can be very, very difficult for the defenders to do much. You have to choose exactly the right positions to stand, exactly the right ways to use your supporting units, craft your lines well, and there were a few little bits and pieces that the defenders could have done a little bit better from that perspective. But still. Defeat almost a certainty. And that is going to be it for Lothlorien, the first army to completely be vanquished. So Tommy himself, on his own map, in his own home, forced out. Linden, I think, over here, pretty much completely gone. There's a few wards of Alos Tyrion that remain. A black Uruk and a white Uruk. Staying behind to try and finish this one off. Melee defense going to be... A potential issue. 
Plenty of pole arms in close proximity though. As the misty mountains move forward. Over here. Four London archers. Mm. Witches of Angmar being used as... I mean, it's a bad sign when the witches have been able to use up all their ammunition, of course. We have a look. Yeah, it's it's gonna... It's At the moment, it's 9%, but it will end pretty much as around 10%, and I think that makes sense. I, I think from when the attackers started to seize the momentum in the first layer, the defenders have never really been able to get that back, or at least get it enough away from the attackers that they had a bit of breathing room to try and reorganise themselves. And ultimately the attackers were putting the pressure on them from that perspective, making it more difficult. And that, you have to say, was a real difference maker. There go the four Linden archers. So I guess Linden are the only army still standing with anything? I think the Gondorians are, are gone. What's going on here? Yeah, Warns of Minas Athiel are running. Everything running over here. There's Warns of Elastir, and so that must have been Linden admitting defeat. So Gondor must have something somewhere. But where? Where have they got something sequestered? My rangers are firing at something. Hello? Is this there? Nope. Temple Guard. Ah. Dumb and Pikeman. All in archers running. Here we go. This one brave soul. Sword in hand. 21 Pikemen are running away from him. That's something I suppose he can die happy with. Because, I mean, he's going to crest this hill and immediately he's going to get shot by Temple Guard, so... Oof, look at that crossfire. Gondor's armour may be well made, but not this well made. And there we have it. A neat map, this. Kind of classic in the way that uh, these big cityscape battles with natural cliff walls as fortifications tend to be. Um, but it's neat to see a new one, um, and also you can tell that some decent amount of thought went into it because it was, you know, very much made with uh, you know, multiple approaches for the attackers in mind. Like I said, I think the attackers, once they really did seize that momentum, it was always going to be quite difficult for them. And it's no surprise, I think, to see that Angmar and Rudal were the two forces among the attackers that managed to get the most kills, because they, of course, were the ones with the most dangerous ranged support units up close. The witches, of course, were devastating. People's opinions on that may be a little bit squiffy, shall we say, but even without the witches, the attackers would have won this. So as much as they were flashy in the late game and pushed it to be more of an attacker victory than it otherwise would have been, the defenders didn't have enough in terms of the quality or the numbers to be able to overcome the advantage the attackers already had laid down. Um, and of course, Rudar with their javelins and axe throws as well, which... In this section of the battle, we see behind the score screen. Um, they were able to use uncontested a little bit too much for my liking um, by the defenders. And like I said, for the defenders, it's a bunch of small things. The attackers played well, which is always going to make life very difficult for you in this kind of situation. But yeah, as I say, interesting. Now then, let's have a look at what got the kills. Tommy's army did certainly get a lot of kills, so it goes to show that the numbers heavy approach means you need to have tons and tons of kills, and even then, it may not be enough. Uh, 300 kills on Watchers of the Golden Wood, um, nearly 400 on one of the Kindred of Caliborn. We've also got 500 on one of the Lauren Armed Archers. Karas Caladon's Guardians are one of the disappointments, but that's because they tried to fight a battle that was already lost. If they pulled them back, that was one of the ways in which maybe things could have turned around a little bit more. You can tell where the momentum really did start to tell, because a lot of the ranged units here for Lothlorien really did a very good job, but a lot of the melee units actually underperformed. Um, and that uh, is a sign that that initial outer defence was where things started to unravel, I think. Uh, Karen Amroth, Rangers. 376 is not bad for a unit of Rangers, but yeah, in this sort of situation you probably do need a little bit more. Um, we can only guess at what the other armies were able to get. Linden getting a lot of kills as well. Um, but again, when you look at the, uh, the massive Misty Mountains army, just shy of 4,000 units on their own. Um, and then obviously the 
the smallest army on display for the attackers today uh, was actually Mordor, um, just barely. So that goes to show just how many numbers um, were really being brought to bear. Very numbers heavy from Angmar actually as well, interestingly enough, which you don't see too much of, but it worked out very well for the Warlord here, um, who will, would have been very uh, happy with his performance in this battle as well. So yes, that was another battle by Tommy. I still have a couple from him actually, because ever since coming back from work I have been given another round of replays I can get to, which is probably enough to fill um, three weeks pretty much, maybe even a little bit more. Um, so that's good. Um, that will keep me busy for the time being, though of course more is always welcome should you wish to send any to me. We will be seeing uh, a little bit more from... I've been given a few uh, replays actually from Silmarillion as well. Um, so it'll be nice to uh, to get back into that a little bit and uh, start sprinkling in a little bit more variety once more. Um, and of course plenty more replays from Reforged as well. Um, like I said, the... Or like I have been saying in these endgame splash screens, a sort of update at some point or another will be necessary, I think, um, in terms of letting people know what's going to be happening as the year progresses. It's it's still very muddied waters from my perspective. I've got a kind of a clear idea of what's going to be happening, and that is that nothing's really going to be changing in the short term, um, which is kind of unfortunate, but longer term it may very well end up paying off a little bit more for me. Um, We'll see. It's it's one of those things where I, I really don't know at this point. It's it's kind of it's kind of crazy, kind of all over the place, and uh, it, it's not something that I can offer any sort of concrete information on. Though, like I say, regardless of what happens, really, I don't think it'll actually end up having too great of an effect on the channel. Um, so, it may just be a lot of hot air about nothing from my perspective. But there is always the possibility that at some point something changes where it will have to affect the channel whether that's you know in terms of just moving the the upload days around or something like that um, so that is something worth bearing in mind as the year goes on it's going to be a little bit more uh, a little bit more unpredictable I would say especially as we start to get into sort of summer I would say um, there is also the fact that you know trips away for work are still going to be continuing uh, for the time being essentially um, so that means that much like the last one, though the last one was only 10 days, I can be away for up to three weeks, which is fairly likely going forward. Um, so hopefully my backlog is going to be hardy enough to withstand that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's weird. It's the sort of thing which I can't really offer too much in the way of context on, because it would take far too long to explain all of it. And it's also the sort of thing which ultimately may be kind of pointless information anyway. Um, ultimately, in terms of channel effect, I'm trying to make sure that it doesn't affect the channel at all, and it shouldn't, but if it does, we'll do like a proper update. Um, if it's more of a minor effect, then I think we can do it through the uh, the YouTube uh, community uh, with uh, uploaded messages. And uh, I think that will probably be the way that we go in the short term, at the very least. Uh, as for other things, like I mentioned, Tommy has sent me a few replays. I've got a few replays from other people as well, with a few... Uh, custom scenarios including a Battle of the Five Armies one, there's also I think a an Osgiliath battle coming up which we haven't seen Osgiliath in quite a while so that should be fairly neat of course Tommy has sent me another replay as well which is a custom scenario once again which I think is a Dol Amroth one uh, so yeah plenty of uh, plenty of things to be getting on with with, uh, with the replays for the time being and of course there is the new patch which uh, is the sort of thing to keep an eye on as well. As much as I've got a giant backlog at this point where I've recorded pretty much a month and a half in advance, if the new patch does release, we're going to have that weird in-between moment where I will still be uploading videos uh, from the old patch as the new stuff also gets dripped in. Um, and faction overviews will be first and foremost in my mind when the new patch does eventually drop. Um, so yeah. A big thank you to Tommy, once again, for creating this map and uh, hosting this battle replay. Big thank you to all of the players for being a part of it and allowing this replay to get sent to me. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.